Hello, and welcome to Still Behind the Bench. My name is Adam, and on this channel, I will attempt to describe the science behind distilling spirits in a more technical way. Hopefully, it'll whet your appetite to learn more and teach you enough so that you're more self-sufficient. So for this video, I'm going to be talking about fruit and grain mashes, specifically how they pertain to cyanogenic glycosides, glycosidic nitriles, and maybe a little bit about ethyl carbamate. So let's get started. Okay, so to start, um, I'm going to say that I will be doing a related video, uh, mostly about another way that ethyl carbamate is being produced. But for this video, I'm going to be talking about your feedstocks. So, you know, your fruits, your vegetables, your grains, as being the source of this issue. And the end point for this issue is always going to be ethyl carbamate. The next thing I want to say is that glycosidic nitrile and cyanogenic glycoside they may sound like two separate but related things, but they are in fact describing the exact same thing. Just for some reason, these two terms were coined by two different groups looking at different sets of plants. So glycosidic nitrile seems to be relegated to referencing grains and specifically malted barley. And I think that the reason for this is that most other grains used in making beers or spirits aren't malted. And I imagine if you did malt them, you would find that they also have glycosidic nitriles in them. So glycosidic nitriles is usually relegated to malted barley, and cyanogenic glycosides seem to seems to be the term used for literally every other plant. I should I'll also note that sometimes in uh, studies, scientific studies, you may find malted barley is actually being referenced by cyanogenic glucoside or sorry, glycoside, because this is the catch-all term for the, these types of compounds. And so before I get into the nitty-gritty of this video, uh, I wanted to explain what a cyanogenic glycoside is in the first place. Then you'll understand why it is also sometimes referred to as a glycosidic nitrile. So a glycoside of any kind is just a sugar molecule attached to something else. In this case, what, is what it is attached to is a compound that can be easily turned into a cyanide. So cyanogenic means, you know, cyanide causing, and then glycoside is just sugar molecule. So cyanide causing sugar molecule, or sugar-based molecule, I should say. Specifically, what is typically attached will be, so you'll have your nitrile functional group, and then also you'll usually have something else attached. A lot of the time it's uh, a, what's called a benzene ring. So I'm going to use amygdalin here as a quick example. So there are essentially two main parts to this molecule. You have what's called the glycone and the aglycone. So the glycone is the sugar portion. So that's just this part of the molecule. And then the aglycone is the non-sugar portion. So that would be just this part. In this case, we have two glucose molecules attached to a nitrile and then to a benzene ring. And that's essentially what it is. So you have your glycoside, glycosidic, nitrile. Sometimes they only have one glucose or it might not even be glucose. It could be fructose, galactose, I've seen rhamnose, uh, all kinds of different molecules or sugar molecules but yeah glycosidic nitrile and then because uh, hydrogen cyanide or because cyanide is essentially just uh, a nitrile group with something attached to it you get your cyanogenic glycoside and that's essentially why it is named that way now let's talk about some fruits and vegetable mashes so certain fruit and vegetables, in fact, a huge amount of different plants in general, have this class of compound called the cyanogenic glycoside. There are around 25 known different cyanogenic glycosides. Um, just to give you an example of some of the fruit and vegetables that you may already know of, the entire rosaceae family of plants creates a specific cyanogenic glycoside called amygdalin. So plants in the rosaceae family include juneberries, chokeberries, quinces, loquats, toyones, apples, pears, Indian plums, strawberries, roses, and then the entire genus of prunus, which includes almonds, apricots, cherries, nectarines, peaches, and plums. 
and then all the crosses between them and all the other variations. Non-rosaceae plants that also include or also produce cyanogenic glycosides, but not necessarily amygdalin, include cassava, bamboo shoots, linseed, which is also known as flaxseed, uh, lima beans, cocoa yams, chickpeas, cashews, and even sorghum, uh, just to name a few others. So I'm only going to focus on the prunus genus, aka stone fruit, and then I'm going to talk a bit about cassava and sorghum. But generally speaking, all the cyanogenic glycosides that are in fruits and vegetables undergo the same general steps to turn that glycoside into hydrogen cyanide, which goes on to become ethyl carbamate. They just all use differently named enzymes to do it. So stone fruit, pretty tasty fruit, makes some very good spirits. Entire industries have built up around making non-grape based fruit spirits like eau de vies and rakia. Slivovitz is a very specific rakia. They're this term comes from the Balkans, I believe, like uh, around Croatia. Uh, Slivovic specifically made from plums. So the problem with stone fruit is that a cyanogenic glycoside is produced within the pit. Stone, kernel, seed, whatever you want to call it. You know, technically there might be some in the fleshy part of the fruit as well, but it's going to be negligible. And this is true for a lot of other fruits, like apples. In their case, the cyanogenic glycoside is in the seed as well. The cyanogenic glycoside in stone fruit is the aforementioned amygdalin. Here's what it looks like again. So it's two glucose molecules attached to a nitrile and a benzene ring. It is produced from the amino acid phenylalanine. So to go from this amygdalin to ethyl carbamate, we start with the amygdalin. So you're making your distilled plum or apricot spirit and you decide not to take the stones out. That stone is actually a seed casing, a shell, the shell, which is called the endocarp, for an internal seed. And if it breaks open during mashing or due to heating or there are holes in it like you can see here there's a bit of a a bit of a hole in the side of this for me breaking it open the seed which contains amygdalin and you can see this seed here looks a hell of a lot like a uh, an almond this seed which contains the amygdalin is released and now you have a bunch of amygdalin in your mash and along with that amygdalin comes three enzymes and let's go into what they do so we have our first enzyme over here called amygdalin hydrolase. It is a, a beta glucosidase based enzyme. What it does is it'll come in and it'll break this bond right here and it takes off that first sugar. So what you get from that is a compound, this compound here called prunicin. So then what happens is another enzyme comes into play and it's called prunicin hydrolase. So what it does is it comes in over here and it breaks this bond right here. So now we have two free sugars and we have this over here, the nitrile and the benzene ring still attached together, and they're called Mandelo nitrile. So what happens then is the third enzyme comes into play. It's called Mandelo nitrile lyase. Mandelo nitrile lyase, yeah, here we go, comes in. And it breaks apart the benzene ring and the nitrile. So the nitrile will become hydrogen cyanide. And this benzene ring becomes it's called benzaldehyde. So benzaldehyde, you may not know, but you've probably tasted it before. Benzaldehyde is the essentially what gives almonds their almond flavor. And if you've ever had something that tasted almond-like, there's a very good chance they used an artificial almond flavor and that's benzaldehyde. Benzaldehyde is the artificial almond flavor used for flavoring things. So you have this amygdalin in your wash now. So when you go to ferment, after your yeast uh, has started producing ethanol and generating heat because of the metabolism, that hydrogen cyanide there can start reacting with the ethanol to create ethyl carbamate. Typically, it won't happen a lot during fermentation in the case of the stone fruit and the... Uh, the hydrogen cyanide produced from the amygdalin because there's not a whole lot of heat being generated. A more likely scenario is that it'll just hang around until you go to distill and in the presence of a lot of heat, oxygen, and copper acting as a catalyst, most of that hydrogen cyanide will be, will be turned into ethyl carbamate. In any case of hydrogen cyanide turning into ethyl carbamate, you'll get about a, let's see here, 2.5 to 1 ratio. So uh, about 40%. So, you know, 100 milligrams of hydrogen cyanide would be, end up as 40 milligrams of ethyl carbamate. 
uh, the number one thing you can do to limit ethyl carbamate production in stone fruit spirits is simply to remove the stone before fermenting. It can be a huge pain in the ass. Getting this stone out of the nectarine was a pain in the ass, so I decided to cut one open and just pull the stone out, and that was even harder to do. So depending on the fruit, it can be a huge pain in the ass to get these stones out, but I highly recommend doing it. You know, um, another thing you can do is take precautions to try and only use fruit that isn't severely damaged or infected because you don't want the potential that the seed casing has broken open or has holes in it. Um, if you have the ability to mash the fruit or ferment it in a copper vessel, very few of us probably do that, but if you can, copper can inhibit the creation of hydrogen cyanide precursors by complexing with those precursors and preventing the enzymatic actions. So it can complex with amygdalin. It can complex with prunicin and with mandelonitrile and prevent them from being turned into hydrogen cyanide and benzaldehyde in the first place. So after, after distillation, there can still be sometimes some cyanide compounds in the distillate. UV light can act as a catalyst to cause those cyanide compounds to react with the ethanol and create more ethyl carbamate. So you'll want to use either opaque bottles or color tinted bottles, uh, or if you are going to use a clear bottle, then just keep it out of direct sunlight as much as possible. That's really all you can do for stone fruit. And I can't say how much amygdalin is in any stone or any specific fruit. Even on average, the studies I've read shown ethyl carbamate levels from as low as 50 micrograms per liter up to as high as 18,000 milligrams per liter. Here in Canada, where the limit is 400 micrograms per liter, that 18,000 milligrams is about 45,000 times over the limit. Uh, so you're going to have problems if you end up with that much. So let's go on and talk about some of the, uh, the other plants that you may end up using in a wash. Or a mash. Okay, so cassava, also known as yucca and tapioca. It's a, a starchy root tuber, like a russet potato, only much larger. I'll show a picture on the screen. Uh, in terms of spirits, lots of various spirits are made with it. A lot of them are just sort of moonshine style spirits. You could probably make a vodka out of it because it's a starchy root tuber. There's also a beer made from it called Kasiri. Um, I don't know if I'd ever try it because they use amylase enzymes from your mouth in order to do it. So this is one of those things where they mix it up and then they, they'll take a sip and then they'll swish it around in their mouth and they'll spit it back in. Anyway, so cassava has two cyanogenic glycosides in it called linamarin and lot australin. As usual, when you know you have an enzyme, it always ends in ASE. So you know it's talking about an enzyme. So what it does is it takes linamarin and it changes it into glucose, acetone, and hydrogen cyanide. And then it'll take the lot australin and change it into glucose, methyl ethyl ketone, sometimes known as MEC, and hydrogen cyanide. Quite different from the uh, benzaldehyde and hydrogen cyanide that amygdalin makes. So if you ever have cassava and you want to turn it into a spirit, probably something like uh, a vodka, what you want to do to minimize the presence of these compounds is to shred it or to slice it really thin. You soak it in water for say between 15 and 45 minutes. I mean 15 to 20 minutes is probably going to be long enough. But then what you do is you leave it out overnight in a warm place. Um, if you can hit between 30 degrees Celsius and 35 degrees Celsius, which is 86 degrees Fahrenheit or 95 degrees Fahrenheit, so that this enzymatic conversion can happen, you won't really have to worry about anything because acetone, methyl ethyl ketone, and hydrogen cyanide are all very volatile compounds and they will just evaporate off the surface of the shredded or sliced plant matter. Now it's called the simple wetting process and it's used quite often where cassava grows naturally but a lot of them what they do is they turn it into a flour paste first then they'll spread it really thin and let it dry overnight. Yeah these compounds evaporate out then they can do whatever they want with that cassava flour. So slice and shred, soak, and then leave out to dry over 24 hours. And then that's it for cassava. So I'll talk about sorghum next. Okay, so before I get into sorghum, uh, I forgot to mention it, but linamarin comes from the amino acid valine, 
and lot Osterlin comes from the amino acid isoleucine, just in case you were curious. So sorghum, it's a pretty staple cereal crop um, in Africa and Asia. I think India is the largest producer of it. It comes from Northeast Africa though. Uh, they grow it all over the world now. Even the United States grows it. Uh, I think Kentucky and Tennessee are the largest producers in the United States. They also use it uh, quite often to make shochu in Japan and shaoju baiju and kao yang in china some distilleries in kentucky and tennessee have also made both sorghum rum and sorghum whiskey I'm not sure how they make rum out of it i think they make some sort of sorghum based molasses and i'm not sure the process into getting into that but i'm gonna look into it so sorghum produces both amygdalin and another cyanogenic glyc glycoside called durin uh, a little history durin was the very first cyanogenic glycoside discovered back in 1906. So both of these cyanogenic glycosides are almost exclusively found in the leaves and in the acrospire, which is also known as the sprout of a germinating seed. So it only appears in our instance if you attempted to go through the malting process with sorghum. If you didn't malt it, then it really won't be an issue. You won't find very much amygdalin or durin in the, the kernel of the sorghum. Uh, so durin only has one sugar molecule attached to it. So it only has one beta-glucosidase based enzyme, durin beta-glucosidase, and then the other enzyme in use is hydroxynitrilylase. So the durin gets converted into 4-hydroxybenzaldehyde, and it looks like this, and then your hydrogen cyanide. So 4-hydroxybenzaldehyde has a, mm, a sweet woody almond flavor or sorry odor to it sweet woody almond odor to it um, and it supposedly tastes like a creamy almond sort of so you know if you're drinking sorghum and you get this sort of i don't know sweet woody almond odor to it i mean benzaldehyde will also be putting out an almond odor but you could attribute it to this durin that's it for sorghum it's a pretty simple one you know don't malt it and you don't really have to worry about it but if you do malt it, during the malting process, usually when you go to dry it, the, the rootlets and the acrospire get knocked off. So again, won't be a huge issue, but some of the acrospire is usually still inside the seed casing. So there will be more cyanogenic glycosides present than if you hadn't malted it. But it still probably won't be much of an issue. So let's get on to the, the most important grain in making spirits, malt barley. Okay, so malt barley, which I'm just going to call malt. Um, and glycosidic nitriles, which don't seem to be referenced in relation to any other malted grains. And I think that's just because malt bar or barley is really the only grain that anyone malts in any significant amount. I mean, usually you can buy other grains from malt companies, but they're not necessarily going to be malted grains. Um, I also want to say that malt produces vastly less hydrogen cyanide and thus ethyl carbamate. And I'll get into that in a bit. I also want to get into a bit of history and what the malt grain industry has done about this at the end of this malt section. So the precursor that is present in malt is called epiheterodendron. Most of that epiheterodendron is contained within the acrospire of the malted grain. And the acrospire, uh, again, for those that don't know, is the initial sprout or stem that comes out of the seed husk. I'll show a picture. Some of that acrospire is still within the bran though. You can see in the photo that the green sprout is the acrospire and then the multiple white parts are the rootlets. So you'd see this on what is called a green malt. And a green malt is just one that is undried or unkilned. But on the kilned and dried malts, during the drying process or during a separate process, both that acrospire and the rootlets, the parts that are outside of the seed husk, become uh, very delicate and brittle and they break off, which is what we want to happen. So the synthesis, the synthesis process to get to hydrogen cyanide, I'm going to be skipping a bunch of steps that happen within the malted grain before drying because they aren't super important, but I'll put all the steps in the description for those that want to know. So through a bunch of steps, you go from the amino acid leucine all the way down into ethyl carbamate. Uh, leucine is an amino acid commonly found in pretty much all living creatures, flora and fauna. It gets turned into epiheterodendron through the magic of malted barley enzymes. So again, it doesn't happen if the Barley isn't malted, just like with the sorghum. So after you've milled the malted grain, mashed, and then started fermenting, the yeast will release a beta-glucosidase enzyme, which just so happens to be able to break down epiheterodendron. It takes it and it splits it 
into a glucose molecule and another compound called isobutyraldehyde cyanohydrin. So now you have this isobutyraldehyde cyanohydrin floating around inside your fermented wash. You take your fermented wash, you pour it into your still, and then you start distilling, and it undergoes thermal decomposition. That splits it into isobutyraldehyde and hydrogen cyanide. Then that hydrogen cyanide in the presence of heat, water, oxygen, and copper as a catalyst reacts with the ethanol that was produced from the yeast, and it gets turned into ethyl carbamate. But I really don't think the quantities of ethyl carbamate coming from malted grains of really of any type that you're going to be using very often are going to be a big issue. But when it comes to wild versions of these grains or very old versions of these grains, ones that weren't specially bred for distilling, knowing about glycosidic nitriles, I can't really say for sure how much would be produced, but I don't think it's going to be a problem really. And as such, I didn't really, I wasn't really going to talk about malts or sorghum because I didn't think they'd be a problem, but I figured I'd do it just to show you that these compounds are present in most plants even some of the plants you use a lot and eat a lot. So I'm going to talk a bit about the history of ethyl carbamate and glycosidic nitriles. Ethyl carbamate has been known to be toxic for many decades now, and it's been presumed to be carcinogenic for a very long time. It wasn't until the late 60s it was confirmed to be, to be carcinogenic after doing tests on rats and mice. So then in the 1980s, malting companies in various regions of the world starting to getting started getting together in their regions uh, i believe scotland was the first one to do this already knowing that malted barley leads to ethyl carbamate production because they had been studying that aspect of it since the 40s and they decided to endeavor to find what they now term low glycosidic nitrile varieties or low gn varieties so most malt varieties you find today are low gn especially if you're getting your malts from the uk uh, you know, as Scotland led the charge in finding and creating these varieties that are low in GN value. North American companies really only started to catch up in around the mid-2000s, and these low GN varieties will produce ethyl carbamate uh, quantities magnitudes lower than most maximum amounts regulated by any government. So even if your malt barley has a more significant amount than a specifically bred low GN variety is going to be extremely small. But like I said, if I was to use something like a wild grain that's not specifically bred for low GN and I malted them, it could possibly cause an issue. I can't say for sure. But if I was a professional distiller, I would definitely have it tested at least once to find out the ethyl carbamate value and maybe even the hydrogen cyanide concentrations after distilling. Better to be safe and pay that one-time cost than having to do a recall. The other thing I wanted to touch on that I'll uh, talk more about in the video I do on ethyl carbamate is that ethyl carbamate isn't very volatile in the first place. So while you could be producing a significant amount after fermenting and while distilling in the pot of the still, not all of it will transfer over into your distillate. And if for whatever reason you do have your spirit tested and the levels are too high for whatever laws are in your area, or just too high for your liking, you can always just redistill re it again, and even less of that ethyl carbamate will transfer over. Uh, and that's it for the malt barley section of this video. Um, before I get into the last part, which is on why plants create these compounds in the first place, I'd like to thank my Patreons especially you, Chris, uh, but all my Patreons as well. I, I thank you. I can't, I can't thank you enough. Contributions do help me out. For others, my Patreon link is down in the description. Check it out. Uh, if you want to donate, please do. If not, that's cool too. So let's get into why do these plants create these compounds in the first place. Okay, so why do these plants create these compounds in the first place? Well, you may have noticed a trend that these compounds are produced in the seeds, uh, and sprouting parts, you know, in the acrospire. These are my roots, or rootlets, I should say. So why is that? Because these are the parts of the plant that needs to survive in order to even get a chance at existing. So these compounds are produced to stop animals from eating them in the first place. Cyanogenic glycosides aren't the only ones produced by plants either. Lots of plants produce lots of different toxins for the exact same purpose. You may know of the toxic alkaloid solanine uh, produced in potatoes. So the green parts of potatoes and the eyes of potatoes contain a compound called solanine. Uh, tomatine is produced in 
uh, green tomatoes. In the case of tomatoes, it breaks down as the tomato ripens and turns red. There's also a very prolifically produced toxin that you probably consume almost daily if you drink tea, coffee, wine, or wood-aged spirit. You may already know what I'm talking about, but it is tannins lots of different tannins and they're one of the main purposes they're produced is as a plant toxin let me give you a little story about plant toxin doing its thing so i got this story from a bbc documentary on killer plants uh, so the story goes like this back in the mid 80s in south africa some man was farming herds of an antelope called kudu. Uh, it was graving in a savanna-like region and there was a drought going on at the time so the kudu approached this massive grove of what are called acacia trees let's see a c a c i a so acacia trees uh, and there were thousands so there's thousands of trees and there were thousands of kudu present so they started stripping off the leaves on these trees cut to a few days later all of a sudden all these kudu start dropping dead large and small male and female young and old dropping dead thousands of them it took three years to figure out what happened so here's what happened the kudu grazed all along the beginning of this grove starts stripping off the leaves the tree understands that its leaves are getting taken away from it and it understands that it needs to create some sort of defense so one of the things they do when you start stripping the leaves off of them is they'll start producing a plant hormone called ethylene and it releases it as a gas so the wind started coming in and this ethylene gas started wafting through the grove so when these other acacia trees detected that ethylene gas it triggered them to start dumping massive amounts of tannins into their leaf excessive amounts so what happened is these kudu get to these new trees pick them clean the cycle repeats deeper into the grove however if you watched my tannins video and enzymes video you know that enzymes are proteins and tannins attach to protein this is what happened in the kudu the tannins bound themselves to the kudu's digestive enzymes in their digestive tract and digestion within the animal came crashing to a halt it blocked up all the matter the plant matter in their stomach because it couldn't be digested and they just ended up dying because of it so it turns out that the the movie the happening can sort of happen but in a much less threatening way in fact i bet this incident from south africa is the sort of the the base for the idea of that movie as bad as it was that's it for this video on uh, cyanogenic glycosides, uh, glycosidic nitriles, fruit mashes, vegetable mashes, grain mashes, and ethyl carbamate. I hope you learned something. Please click like and subscribe if you want to see more, and have a great week.